Okay. Um, my presentation is probably going to be a bit more project specific rather than an overview of my host site. And I feel like that was a really hard presentation to follow, Mona. That was so sentimental and wonderful. <laughs> um, but I'll start by saying uh, one of the main goals of Grizzly Corps is to explore place-based solutions for communities facing climate change. And my last year of living in Reading has opened my eyes to how diverse these strategies can be. So if you're looking at this and wondering what the heck cattle can do to build community resilience to climate change, you are not alone. And it took me quite some time to understand. Um, but beef cattle make up a significant part of Shasta County's agricultural production. And my host site, the McConnell Foundation, leases one of their properties to Pray Their Ranch, a local rancher. Um, there are many ways to graze cattle that are detrimental to the environment. And there are ways to graze cattle that achieve multiple co-benefits, such as theoretically carbon sequestration, uh, the protection of threatened grassland species, and the control of invasive plants. So I hope to sort of explain what I've learned about managed grazing um, over the past year. And I'm going to start off with a disclaimer too that I decided to use story maps because I got obsessed with learning like entry level GIS this year and I think it's the coolest thing ever. Um, but it's pretty wordy because it's also meant to la last on the McConnell's um, website. So please don't read all the words. You don't need to. Um, I basically spent a lot of my time writing a grazing management plan for uh, this herd that we have on our land. And I guess to start out, um, grazing management plans are like the starting step to sustainable grazing. So it allows you to kind of create specific goals and objectives for different areas of the property, um, as well as the property overall. And inevitably, uh, precipitation kind of determines everything in the ranching world. And so things are gonna change and nothing will go to plan. Um, but having this grazing management quote unquote plan is really helpful to give some guidance for when things do change. And as you can see here with my goals of improving ecological benefits, increasing forage production and creating a more drought and fire resilient landscape, there's the tricky balance between sustainability and economic production that you have to meet um, with any form of agriculture. These are some adorable turkey eggs that I came really close to running over and thankfully didn't. And these are some more specific objectives um, that we focused on. Increasing perennial grasses is a big one. We'd ideally like to see an increase in um, carbon organic content in the soil, balancing the amount of animals you have in the forage production because over grazing, we really wanna avoid that maintaining adequate residual dry matter, and I'll get to that a little more later. Um, increasing percentage of native plants, and that's a tricky one with ranching because there's also the balance of ranchers arguing, well, native plants don't have as much uh, fat to them and they don't give as much nutritional value and kind of having to navigate wanting to create a more ecologically friendly ranching um, operation, but also feeding the cattle enough. Problematic invasive weeds can be addressed by grazing, and we'd also like to maintain and enhance bird and wildlife populations. This is the beautiful little barn at the property that I work on. And a bit of background is that the McConnell Foundation um, bought the property in 2010, and it's primarily annual grasslands with blue oak woodland, but a few pastures have been seeded with perennial grasses, um, hence the goal of carbon sequestration. And one of those pastures uses this agricultural reservoir um, for irrigation. So managed grazing versus traditional grazing. Um, traditional grazing, you could just say, the rancher lets the cows into a large area and they graze the whole area however they want to. Um, but we try to focus on using this thing called high density rotational grazing. And the way I've heard it described is that cows are really picky and they're always gonna choose their ice cream plants that taste really good. But sometimes we wanna use them to eat their broccoli plants that we don't really want, such as some like weeds like Medusa head. Um, so when you put a bunch of cows into a small pasture for 
a short amount of time, it kind of forces them to eat everything evenly. And ideally that if you have perennial grasses, it gives the perennials enough time to rest because you'll move them out as soon as they've eaten down everything evenly and give those grasses over a month of rest. And then ideally they're able to rebound and you can graze it again. And we also have um, dryland pastures. So we kind of focus more on weed control or maybe like we're planning a prescribed burn on part of the property. So we don't split up the pastures and have this intensive movement of cattle, but we do try to address goals with those pastures instead of just dumping a bunch of cows in them. And my whole bit was with story maps. So I basically use information from Web Soil Survey and our carbon farm plan and calculated how much forage each pasture could produce in just an average year, which is kind of tricky because we don't really know if we're going to get another average year for a while. It doesn't seem like average happens anymore. But um, I kind of use that information to guesstimate how many animal unit months um, each pasture could support and how long the cattle could graze each pasture. So I made this nifty little story map and I'll just mention a few things to not get into the weeds too much. But this is the property that I work on and it has a bunch of different pastures. And the big irrigated pasture is the one where we're doing that high density grazing. And um, we actually keep the cows on the pasture or on the property year round, which is pretty unique because a lot of cattle ranchers have to like ship like their cows and semi trucks all the way to another location in the dry months of the summer because we get absolutely no rain during that time. And they kind of have different like grazing seasons. But for us, we're really lucky that we have these reservoirs um, because we have a gravity gravity fed flood irrigation system. So we get to keep the cows year round. Um, and the way we separate it out is with a ton of electric fencing. And that has been a significant portion of my year is setting up, building, taking down electric fences. Um, and depending on what section of this pasture they're on, they get to access water from these three different pastures, triangle, milkweed, and long pasture. And we have permanent troughs that are also gravity fed by these reservoirs. So the basis of this grazing rotation schedule, um, I could have just put up a spreadsheet and kind of bored everyone with a bunch of random numbers, but I decided to do this little map to take us along the journey that the cows will go on potentially. Um, and so the main basis of why I have them on certain pastures at certain times beyond irrigated versus dry land, that's because of the rain, is that we move the cows either on foot or on quads or kabotas, and sometimes they can be particularly difficult to move. So we never want to move them from one side of the ranch all the way to the other side because they will get very upset with us and it will probably be incredibly ineffective. So um, North Pasture is a good example of we're splitting it in half down the middle, basically. And we treated this whole 62 acre section on the east side for a potential prescribed burn this year. And that was my other main project was um, creating a prescription for the mechanical treatment and helping um, got to learn how to use chainsaws and exist in poison oak for months on end. And so, yeah, really hoping for a poison oak cure. Michaela mentioned looking into that yesterday. So then following the easiest method, bump them over to here. On to star thistle flat. As the name suggests, yellow star thistle is a really big problem on our property. And that field is essentially completely star thistle with some annual grasses. So we, it could be a strategy to either burn it or have the cattle graze it really hard to try to deal with that. And then moving on. The last pasture I have us grazing is um, for wildfire risk reduction because that's another benefit of the cattle on this property. And 
we actually bring them to another property um, that's an open space for that exact benefit. So we don't have to mow as much. And I wanted to make a quick note on riparian areas. We do have two different creeks on the property. Um, and some disruption to the riparian area is beneficial, um, but it has to be carefully monitored because we don't want to um, pollute the stream with their manure or overgraze those plants um, and have them tromp around the edges of the stream too much and erode it. So that's kind of a season by season decision of, uh, is it a good time to graze this area or should we let it rest for a few years? We did graze it this year, so maybe it would be better to rest it next year. And with any good plan, you have to have some monitoring to make sure that you're actually doing a good job on your goals. Um, and for us, that for my job, um, it was mostly taking clippings of multiple kinds. So residual dry matter, um, basically it's just whatever's left over after the grazing season. And um, it doesn't really matter what the quality of it is, if it's all, star thistle, we still um, weigh it just the same because you just want stuff covering the ground to prevent um, nutrient losses and soil erosion. So just having those roots in the ground is important and not um, completely grazing down to the ground is really important. And this is the little hoop we used to take the clippings. It's definitely not rocket science. You just put the hoop down and take some scissors and put it in a bag. And we do basically the same thing with forage production. Um, after a few years of taking forage production, we hopefully won't have to rely on my complicated map overlaying soil with pastures. Um, and we'll actually have on the ground data about how much we're producing. And my favorite, favorite part of this year was working with our Point Blue partner biologist and Point Blue, um, basically has a program where they monitor rangelands and they use avian point count soil sampling and vegetation monitoring and use the information they gather to inform landowners of suggested uh, changes to their processes or you know you're doing this great we've seen increases in bird populations and your soil's looking great it's just a good way to share back um, if conservation practices are doing their intended effects or not. Um, we have a bunch of lupins on the property. They're actually poisonous to cattle, but they are beautiful. And for the most part, the cows just don't like them anyways. So we had lupins for most of the springtime. These grazing records are another way that we keep track of stuff. You'll notice a lot of black lines because um, we actually rotate the cattle pretty often. Each of these little lines is a single day. So sometimes we're rotating them pretty quickly. Like this is only five days that they were in that section. And we actually do have lives outside of work and don't wanna work every weekend and evening. So we kind of decided to block out some dates in which we're like, we're not gonna move the cows there. So we're gonna have to plan it out accordingly. Um, and I also like this because it's a lot more accessible to all the staff to just have a paper copy, a paper copy that's in the office. Um, no one needs a computer to access it, and it's pretty straightforward. As I mentioned before, everything changes all the time. Um, current precipitation levels and how much forage you have, you have to monitor because the rancher's number one enemy is haying their cows. It's really expensive, and it's a lot better to just magically have the feed that you need the whole year. Um, and it's, we live in a drought and we use flood irrigation. So it is important to note that in extreme drought years, we might have to shut off the irrigation. Um, and that is kind of the beauty of our irrigated pastures since it is perennials and it's a mixture of different kinds of plants. Um, ideally, if we did have to shut off the irrigation, the plants would still be able to survive, maybe go dormant for a little bit, but bounce back once we start the irrigation again. And from a biological perspective, we don't wanna graze the plants at the same phenological cycle each year that can really impact them in the long term. And finally, I live in Redding. Um, we have fire, we have a lot of fire. So cattle need uh, wildfire evacuation plans too. This is a picture I took on, oh, didn't want to do that. 
Well, that's a picture I took on the property um, this year. We've gone all over. That's okay, we're towards the end of my presentation. <laughs> um, and it can also be important to have a sacrifice field, which is basically if it comes down to it and you have to hay, you have to flake hay, um, you want something for your cattle to eat. So you would have to essentially put them in a small pasture, give them a lot of hay, and they're gonna heavily impact that pasture and it might not recover. Um, but the cows have to eat if you wanna continue your operation. And thankfully, Prather Ranch has been a really good partner with us and we're able to communicate with uh, the staff a lot to tell them, hey, we can't handle this amount of cattle or hey, we really need more cattle because we have a star thistle problem and we wanna be able to attack it now. Um, or stockpiling feed in preparation for a drought. It's really hard to predict the future, but it can be helpful in changing times where we're seeing more and more droughts um, as the years go on. And that is the end of my presentation. Um, just wanted to give a big shout out to my housemates for getting me through tough times this year. And also, I feel like I really lucked out on my Grizzly Corps support system. I didn't expect to make friends from very far away, but it's been an awesome um, support network and I'm very grateful. That's all. Thank you so much, Kaylee. That was amazing. Um, you've done some incredible work this year and we've definitely been really lucky to have you on the Grizzly Core team. So thanks for everything. If anyone has any questions, feel free to raise your hand, unmute yourself, um, or put any questions you have in the chat.